I am going to wait another couple of minutes in case any more people join. Events at Berkeley normally start at 10 after, and we're giving another two minutes. Sounds good. We have a message. Good morning from Sydney. Oh, how great. <laughs> Hello, Thank Michelle. You for letting us know from how far away you are joining us. Am I the only one here? No, I think we are about to get started. So, so. Mm -hmm. We're giving it one more minute and then we okay. start. So I am uh, Professor Maria Mavrudi. I want to welcome everybody to this event by the Center of Middle Eastern Studies at the University of California at Berkeley. I want to welcome especially our speaker and book presenter today, uh, Dr. Alda Benjamin, uh, who, whose presence at Berkeley is the gift of uh, the generosity of uh, Nora uh, Bet Youssef Lacey in memory of her father, Avimelech Bet Youssef. Uh, he was a very important scholar and intellectual of Iranian Assyrian extraction, a legal scholar and author of books on law and a number of other important treatises and a great contributor to modern Assyrian intellectual life internationally. Uh, Alda is, uh, I, I want to introduce everybody like who is who. My name is Maria Mavrudi. I'm the professor of Byzantine history at the University of California at Berkeley. I am joined as presenter by Professor Christine Filiu, who teaches Ottoman history at our university. And the, the two of us are going to respond uh, to Alda's um, uh, presentation, brief presentation of her book trying to explain the importance of her contribution for our, from the point of view of our respective disciplines. Uh, without further ado, I would like to give uh, the floor to Alda uh, to uh, present her new book with Cambridge University Press, of which we are all here at Berkeley very proud because we hosted her uh, during the last two years of, uh, of like the finishing touches to a very long, lifelong project, I should say. So please, Alda. Thank you, Christine. Um, thank you, Maria, for this uh, really kind introduction. Um, I want to thank Asad Ahmad, uh, the Chair of Center of Middle Eastern Studies for hosting this talk, uh, and the wonderful Neil Galley for, for putting this together and, and uh, supporting the events that we're organizing. Uh, I want to thank you, Maria, and Christine, you as well, um, along with the history department that has hosted me for the past two years, um, year and a half almost, with the support of um, Nora Lacey and the Avi Malik Bedusa Foundation. I think I accepted this job, correct me, Maria, and then two weeks later, I got the contract from Cambridge. So really, I mean, the book has been supported by other grants, but the last leg, when I had the contract in hand, was done at Berkeley at the History Department. So I'm very grateful for your support. Um, it's still a little bit surreal. It came out uh, technically on February 3rd. Some people who pre-ordered received it earlier. I only got my copy from the press like last week. So it's it's exciting um, to, to talk. Um, it's my first book talk. Again, having the book just been born after about 10 years or so. Uh, so 
I hope this is a, a talk that you all will enjoy. So I want to begin with um, a chapter, two paragraphs from my fourth chapter called Compliance Negotiation Resistant Assyrians Press and Popular Culture 1970s to 1980s. I think these two paragraphs that I will read to you will help tie in a lot of the themes that I talk about in the book. In 1974, an article appeared in Murdana Aturaya, an Assyrian magazine published in Baghdad describing the subject of a rural cultural tradition known as February fire, Nar Shubat. In the mountainous northern regions of the country, Assyrian villagers experienced heavy snowfall and extremely low temperatures in the, wider, in the winter, especially during February. As a result, the tradition of February fire was, a, was practiced, which required that each resident family collect pine branches and place them in a designated area in the village. This continued throughout the month, beginning with the church personnel who were in charge of collecting branches on the first day of the month. During the last days of February, the villagers gathered and set their large collection of trees, tree branches on fire to mark the end of the coldest month of the year. In celebration, they shouted in his word, like soldiers overcoming a fierce battle while women ululated in delight. The following refrain was repeated throughout the ceremony. Mata Shubat, Walyati Adar, February has passed, let March commence. The art article's author used the term Ashuriyun to refer to the interchangeability between the ancient and modern Assyrians. He substantiated this usage by weaving a cultural thread, tying Assyrians to their ancestral villages since, in his words, time immemorial. In those villages, Assyrians had remained observant, muhafadlin, of their language, tradition, and practices, continuing their cultural renditions with complete pride, considering them, in his words, an important and living hayyan, part of their national, immortal culture and humanitarian existence. He reminiscent about the disruption of village life that had resulted from the immigration of Assyrians to Iraqi towns such as Baghdad, Mosul, Kirkuk, and Basra, but remained hopeful, believing that these cultural traditions had followed Assyrians to these urban centers, where they remained, in his words, preserved in their hearts. The author stressed the importance of safeguarding these traditions and not allowing them to become extinct due to the waves of immigration and exile of recent times. Concluding, as long as we live in our beloved country, Iraq, which seeks the progress, modernization, and happiness of its sons, these traditions could continue. You know, and, and, and these two paragraphs really um, identify many important themes in the book, the, the identity, the connection to the past, the, the medieval Christian uh, heritage, language and, and cultural traditions, rural urban migrations, some by choice, others forcefully, effort, and then efforts to preserve the heritage, uh, and, and finally, the cultural and political negotiations that were ongoing at this time. So I wanna to talk to you, um, some of my arguments with you, and I'll share some um, my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, actually, I think I'm not able to. Neil, I don't know if you could um, help. I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. I'll, I'll start reading while, while we put this together. So my, my book sheds new light on the position of Assyrians and minorities in general in Iraqi opposition parties and on their subsequent treatment by the Iraqi state and its judicial institutions. I explore the policies adopted by the early Ba'athist government and examine the Assyrian intellectual response to their being granted certain cultural rights in 1972. I argue that Ba'athist policies toward the Assyrians reflected the regime's response to both internal and external pressures. Internally, the opposition activism of Assyrians and their interactions with regional and international compatriots represented a concern for the central government. Externally, the influence of a vocal diasporic Assyrian community um, on Western governments and human rights organizations resulted in a negative 
in negative publicity for the Ba'athist. From a broader perspective, the intellectual and social movements explored in this book contribute to our understanding of leftist radical movements of the 1960s in the Middle East. It seeks to shift the traditional academic focus from the center, Baghdad, to highlight relations between the center and the periphery. In particular, it deepens our understanding of Iraqi provincial history, since the Syrians engaged within leftist movements were active not only in urban centers, but often in rural, in rural areas as well. Moreover, given that the Assyrians were concentrated in the north, a new story of that region has also been told one that complicates our understanding of the intricate relations between political actors, tribal affiliations, and ethno-religious communities. A rich history is revealed of bilingualism and often multilingualism that challenges the idea of a mono, monoglot Arabic speaking population advanced by the Iraqi state and its associate intellectuals. The individuals whose actions are described in this book employed Arabic, Aramaic, Kurdish and Turkish, not only in their private homes and community centers, but also in their interactions with other political players, intellectuals and state officials. Moreover, I shed light on the history of, the, of Iraq in the 1970s, a decade that is often overlooked in favor of succeeding periods marked by the ascendancy of President uh, Saddam Hussein, late 1970s and the Iran-Iraq war, which began in 1980, uh, lasted until 1988. In studying the early Republican period in Iraq and particularly that of the Ba'ath regime of the early 1970s, I have placed an emphasis on the relations that existed between the Ba'athist regime, the opposition and the Assyrian community. A detailed analysis of the hierarchical relationships between these three entities reveals that the regime was resolved to negotiate and compromise during this earlier period, demonstrating its weakness in the Iraqi North and within the opposition. These types of conciliatory strategic relationships stand in stark contrast to its policies during subsequent periods, often highlighted in Iraqi scholarship that were marked by an increase in spathification policies and violence towards its citizens. Okay, so, uh... I'm going to try to share my PowerPoint again. Are you able to share the screen? Uh, no, I'm not. Hmm. Can you I send? Okay, I, I can, can, I can go over the pictures at the end. It. Or uh, it says host, dis uh, host disabled participant. No, participants is too. I'm sorry? The panelists can uh, share screen too. For example, Maria and Christine, if they have it. I, I can see the share screen button on my end, but yeah. uh, Alda, can you see yours at the very bottom? No, I can see it, but it, it says uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, Alda, I think the issue is you sign as participant uh, mm. instead of okay. panelist. Uh, All righty. <laughs> Can you, can you email the presentation to Neil? Perhaps he can have yeah. it. Yes, you know what? I can do that during the question and answer period. I think they're just pictures to go over. So it's, mm -hmm. um, we can do that later. Okay, so I, I wanna turn to sources and approaches. I think um, that the way I study, write about the community, um, the approaches that I use and access to sources I have begin has, has helped me um, trace this history and, and, and present it in the way uh, that I, I've done. So we've seen over the past uh, decade, uh, the study of Middle Eastern religious, ethnic and linguistic minority communities, um, including various indigenous groups defined during the modern period as minority communities, shifted to include really sophisticated scholarship that challenges previously dominant notions concerning these communities in ways that have undone national, colonial, and imperial narratives. And it has turned some attention to the ways in which these narratives were formed and popularized. A shift has begun to emerge in certain fields whereby many of these communities, which were once studied through theological, classical, and linguistic lenses, are being examined within Middle Eastern, studies as imperial, 
subjects, members of nation states, exiles, transregional actors, and most importantly, as active agents shaping their own destinies. Most of the literature on the Assyrian community has traditionally stemmed from linguistic and theological fields of Semitic and Syriac studies, focusing on the ancient and medieval periods of Eastern Christianity in its linguistic medium of Syriac, um, the liturgical dialect of the Aramaic language used by the churches. Of course, all very important uh, literature and, and, and scholarship produced uh, by this genre. But given the nature of its sources, this literature offers less insight into the lives of, and attitudes of ordinary uh, members of the communities um, of the period than into the, those of Syriac speaking religious scholars and elites. And, and there are, of course, exceptions within this genre. Most studies of these Middle Eastern communities and in particular of how they came to be thought of as minorities um, contend with concepts that inspire uh, new approaches as well as sources selected to examine histories and cultures. I understand the minoritization of the Assyrians to be modern phenomenon derived from historical processes that signifies historical and contemporary practices of discrimination that marginalize communities, relegating them to an inferior status within the modern hierarchy of citizenship. Often, the living memory of violence and the trauma that survivors and their descendants experienced was, was carried with them. This book also engages with the concepts of pluralism rather than adopting a national language that sees groups, these groups as problems or questions. Pluralism celebrates how these communities enriched the cultures of the region and how they preserved languages, notions of homeland, historical memories, and literatures in the face of state pressure, displacement, and exile. Within this context, pluralism can be defined as a linguistic, cultural, and ideological integration, though temporary, of communities within particular spaces. Its importance resides not only in the degree of its success. Moreover, as uh, my book reveals, Assyrians um, were not monolithic static communities, but shared similarities with the Iraqis of various religious and ethnic backgrounds. Although they did not generally identify as Arabs like other minoritized communities, they did identify as Iraqis during the period that I study. Assyrians came to be immersed in the public sphere um, in the second half of the 20th century, contributing to the press and joining political groups. Um, Top-down structured approaches have been also assumed to be appropriate in studying various communities, including Middle Eastern Christians, who have been often considered through the prism of religion, specifically that of their particular denomination, ignoring their minoritization and more pluralistic involvements. This, um, this sectorized approach invoked since the 2000s ignores local processes of historical change and the role of colonial and missionary actors. Um, it, it is now being challenged in rich scholarly discussions of a kind that have not been previously conducted in relation to minority communities. My book is also in dialogue with uh, scholarship on Christians and other non-Muslim communities examining the Assyrians in the context of authoritarianism. The absence of the Assyrians from scholarly discussion reflects not only their omission from national archives and libraries, but also a lack of language training among scholars. Um, students of displaced communities such as the Assyrians can no longer rely on archives, many of which have been destroyed, relocated, or looted, while others remain closed in certain nation states. Some communities have also had to create alternative archives, like the Assyrians are in the process of doing. But the problem with these um, rural, mostly rural communities, uh, you know, they that rely primarily on a oral cultural traditions, uh, they've seen disruptions, uh, and we have disruptions in, in, in our archives and, and the histories that we can construct because of that. Both the Yazidis and the Assyrians have witnessed the destruction of their cultural sites, while the displacement of their populations had disrupted their agricultural way of life. Rural traditions that have been preserved orally for generations have slowly begun to disappear. So like the tradition that I discussed at the beginning of the book, uh, the, the first two paragraphs I read about the, the, the cultural tradition of a February fire. Um, the intellectuals I study were preserving, trying to um, preserve these traditions and, and worry about them in the 70s. And this is also happening again. Um, but some scholarship, like my own work on the Assyrians, have found ways to revisit existing sources, the press, poetry collection, works of literature, and art, 
uh, along with oral histories in order to gain new insights on these communities. An over-reliance on colonial and missionary sources and, not, and, and on the perspective of the state and the cultural majority has diluted our understanding of the Assyrian community. But the incorporation of provincial history um, is one means by which we can ascribe to minority communities agency to them without ignoring their minoritization. So, you know, I can, um, if, if I get a chance to show you some images, I've, I've um, used new un and unexamined archival sources uh, that I was able to retrieve um, in Iraq at the Iraqi National Library and Archives, um, and as well as about the archives that I uh, acquired since 2003. I examined popular songs, uh, interview singers, tracing the movements of cassette tapes, for example, um, and, and periodicals in both Arabic and Aramaic and conduct interviews um, and, and find primary and smaller libraries um, in, in um, various towns and villages near Baghdad, Dahok, Erbil, and Mosul, along with you know, interviews and, and sources that I find in North America and, and, and in Europe. So I think I will stop here. Alda, I think now you should be able to share screen. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thanks so much, Neil. All righty, so I'll move on. I talk about the role of the uh, Assyrians in, in the opposition. Uh, you might ask how many, what is the number of Assyrians that we have? The 1957 census is the best, uh, the best um, census figures that we have for the country. Uh, shows you the percentage of Assyrians in, in, in uh, various provinces. Um, and I want to move on to Mosul, where, where at this time included the province of Jahog. So sort of reminiscent of the, of the uh, Mosul, of uh, Ottoman Mosul uh, to some extent. And you can see that the concentrations uh, of this community in, in various districts. So 23%, 13%, 21%. So they were significant, a smaller community, but, but significant, um, especially when you think of their concentration in the North and, and, the, and the closeness of, of the borders, um, in the North uh, proximity uh, to Iran and Iran was supporting the opposition. So um, I'll move on to some pictures I wanted to show you. The Iraqi National Archives was burned in 2003. Uh, when I visited uh, many years later to begin my archive archival work um, there, I, I, you know, the uh, the uh, the head of the library at the time, uh, Saad Iskandar, uh, said that you know a lot of the material that you might need for the 60s and 70s would would probably be burned, uh, but I was able to find files. I was able to find really important material to supplement the sources that I had. And um, the, the cases, the court cases, the police cases um, in particular from the, the chapter on the communists comes um, from, uh, from the archives that I found. Uh, and, and some images of uh, one of the magazines that I analyzed, um, Murdana Turaya that I've mentioned, um, the, the article that I read. And uh, Maria noted this to me. Uh, actually, Maria, this was your uh, suggestion to include the Arabic and Aramaic together because I, visually, I think it's important to show how much space um, each of, of, um, of the languages is getting. So they're not, these pages are from the same issue uh, from the, uh, the Assyrian Aramaic section and from the Arabic section. And of course, women were highlighted in this issue uh, or in general in, in more than Turaya. And here's another image, uh, one I loved. I actually considered this for my book cover. They, the press did not like it, but you know, here's the language, um, the alphabet, uh, the Assyrian alphabet in the shape of um, athletic figures. Uh, and you can say, you know, ala, beat, gamma, dalat, and, and so on. And um, I think this just shows, you know, modernity, um, progress, standardization um, that, that's going on uh, at the time. Okay, so I think I'll stop here. Thank you. So I'd like to invite Christine to give her response. And then, as I said, I will briefly go through mine. And then the floor is open to everybody's questions. And I'm glad to see we already have a very lively audience. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Maria, and thank you, Alda, for writing this wonderful book. Um, I really enjoyed reading it. 
I found it to be, I urge you all to buy it and read it as soon as possible, whether you are identify yourself as part of this community or not. I am not, um, but I read it through the lens of Ottoman history into post-Ottoman Turkish and Greek and Armenian, of course, history, all of which are related in fascinating ways to this to this case of the Syrians in Iraq. Um, I found it to be um, subtle and insightful and kind of um, clear and straightforward. And yet I found it to be a rare, um, rare in that it is such a sensitive and yet comprehensive and systematic examination of Assyrians in modern Iraq, and we might call them a minority. I was struggling to think, I mean, it kind of opens a whole new vista onto this predicament, this experience of this community or set of communities. And I kept, I thought perhaps we could call them a subnational community or set of communities. I'm not sure, I'm just throwing that out there. Um, I thought that it captured, for me as someone, as I said, I work on the histories that I mentioned. I also teach the Middle East, the modern Middle East. And I just found it um, so fresh in the way that it captures the specificity and the really torturous predicament of Assyrians um, and the subgroups therein of Iraq. Um, and, and it captures the specificity of Iraq also as, as a state formation and as the various waves and political movements and regimes in the 20th century. Um, and yet it invites so many generative comparisons and contrasts with so many other groups, such as the ones that I mentioned that I study, groups within the same geography. I was constantly thinking as, as the discussion of Kurds was happening and of Jews being mentioned, I'm thinking of the ways in which these communities both mirror each other and not at all and are coming into conflict and at other times are in negotiation and alliance depending on the circumstances. Um, and of course, it invites comparisons across a much broader landscape. Um, now, I just found it really fascinating to grapple with this protracted indeterminate status <laughs> of this group, right? And this community with no, and, and it stands in stark contrast to, let's say, um, the Greeks and Armenians and Jews that are left over in Turkey after the Treaty of Lausanne. They are living, even if the, the terms of that treaty are being violated implicitly, they are living in a legal situation where there are particular specific guarantees, supposedly, cultural, political rights, right? Same with Muslims in, um, in Western, Thra in Greek Thrace, right? There is a legal framework for these groups. And I did not sense that there's the same situation. There's no solid ground for the, for the Assyrians, right? There's no international, um, and as I, I'll say in a little bit too, there's no stable great power beyond that is protecting. There is sometimes, but it really is dependent on the shifting tides of politics, right? Um, so this indeterminacy I found just intellectually just um, difficult and, and also just um, generative as I'm saying to think about. Um, now, um, and so much of, and I, I also was struggling to kind of come up with almost like a typology for the larger problematic of, of subnational minorities like this across the Middle East and, and the Balkans even. And it's, you know, so much of it, and the way you tell the story and the way it unfolds, so much of it has to do with timing and the geography and the demographics, right? And um, the fact that this is playing out most of what you're saying is playing out in the second half of the 20th century, mid to late 20th century, let's say. And this is a moment when communism, when labor politics are, are there's an appeal and there's a danger, obviously, in engaging in it. And as a minority trying to negotiate as a subnational group that is not that that does not have the reins of sovereignty in their hands, this is this double-edged sword, right? And so it's, and you tell the story so nicely, the ways that it is both a natural attraction and then of course, as circumstances shift, it's a danger and persecution ensues, right? So it's, um, there is really no solution for, <laughs> for, these, for these communities, right? There's no safe, it doesn't feel that there's a safe space <laughs> for them. And maybe that's a naive phrase to even bring in here. Um, and, um, it made me think also of 
the predicament of, let's say, Asia Minor Greeks who had been exchanged, who had been forcibly, you know, relocated slash repatriated to Greece after 1923, and the extent to which they also, as kind of a displaced, it, they have a slightly different situation, but it, it is interesting in this context that they are not a official minority. They're obviously they're Greek Orthodox, and some a lot of them are Greek speaking, some of them aren't, but they're not a political minority, and yet they behave in some ways as a half separate group within Greece. And that I found myself thinking in new ways about that case, even though this is not about them. Um, and of course, in terms of the allure and the danger of communism, Jews in so many urban areas, right? That that it's a similar draw of like, you know, a, a kind of a cosmopolitan group that's used to some kind of pluralism is drawn to these ideologies, which promise a kind of ecumenism implicit in, in the whole political project, right? Um, and then of course, the question of great power protection that I mentioned a second ago, uh, Britain, of course, in the early part of the story is there. And then it's not when they want in the 60s, I think it is right when it's important for them to have better relations with the Arabized Iraq, then suddenly becomes more of a liability, um, right, to make the same kinds of overtures and, and take any risk uh, to help the Assyrians. Um, and um, I just thought that you, you captured this, I mean, it's agency and shifting agency and you use the term negotiation in the title. It is about, it is really about negotiation. Um, it is, um, it's this limited and constantly shifting space of partial agency, right? It's this indeterminacy. Um, and I just, I'll just end with this question. You know, I found myself trying to plug them into like Benedict Anderson, right? imagine it's not it's not it's like a it's a community struggling to imagine itself there are many options of how they could play out the imagination it often i mean in benedict anderson's case it goes along with political sovereignty self-realization self-determination and i don't think you can ever even it it's not i don't think is anyone even ever attempting to make it that to have a secessionist like a a, a self-determined national state of Assyrians, or is it really just, um, it's, it's a struggle for how to imagine oneself or one's community in Iraq, <laughs> right? Um, and so it's this struggle against, um, against the shifting tides of how Iraq itself is, is imagining itself and, and being imagined, right? So it's, there's just so many levels of um, political and cultural and social flux that I found it Again, just extremely productive and um, enlightening. Um, and I, I would hope that it becomes assigned reading for modern Middle East classes so that students can see yet another layer of complexity um, from the point of view of this community itself, as you said, rather than from the top down from the uh, Iraqi regime or from Great Britain to see it really how it was experienced on the ground. So I congratulate you and I look forward to hearing more about your thoughts. Thank you so much, Christine. Really yeah. appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, here I am uh, offering my own two cents <laughs> in Alda's book. We've been in conversation for the last two years. I work on, uh, I work on bilingualism in the Middle Ages and a lot of Alda's work in the modern period has helped me think of my own questions. Uh, for Alda and perhaps the audience as well, uh, I want to offer an explanation. What is a medievalist doing? As a Byzantinist, I deal with the Middle Ages. Why am I so vividly interested in Alda's work and why does it speak to me? So I want to offer the view from the point of view of a, of a medievalist. Uh, we medievalists have to uh, grapple with the fact that the rise of the study of the Middle Ages as a modern discipline is the result of intellectual and political developments of the 18th and 19th centuries. So romantic nationalism is conceived of in the 18th century. It is politically implemented, depending on which part of the world one is, at the, in the course of the 19th and in the early 20th century. And from the point of view of nationalism, if you look at the Middle East, uh, you know, Europe exports paradigms. So the rise of nationalism, the development of romantic nationalism is effectively a European product. And the study of the Western Middle Ages helped it articulate itself 
as a 19th and 20th century phenomenon. From the point of the Middle East, you cannot easily export the European paradigm. So as uh, scholars of the Middle East well know, nationalism in the Middle East does not work in the same way as in the European uh, paradigm. And uh, the various um, ethno-religious communities in the Middle East living uh, identified as minorities, as we already mentioned, this is a problematic term, but it will do for now. Uh, so all, all of these ethno-religious groups that are living among uh, in a polity ruled by Muslims, they have a sense of community. And then um, modern scholarship has discussed how Western um, uh, missionaries come among them in the course of the 18th, the 19th, the early 20th century, and create a sense of ethno-religious community that is modeled after the European paradigm. And it's a big discussion in scholarship, does this fit, does this not fit? Um, I'm not uh, about to answer this question. I just want to label it as a problem and also explain uh, how this applied in my own field and how Alda's book illuminates it. Uh, the, um, if, if as a medievalist you want to study not the Western Middle Ages, but the Middle East and the ethno-religious communities in the medieval Middle East, you do not encounter the history of a people normally, but you encounter the history of a church or different churches and the history of a literature written in a particular language. So for example, you have histories of um, uh, Christian Arabic literature histories of uh, uh, Syriac literature. And you have them written from different points of view, from uh, like an interconfessional literature in Syriac, or literatures in Syriac where authors are grouped according to their particular kind of Christianity, provided that they all use Syriac as a language. And uh, this has been the normal order of doing things into the 1970s, into the 1980s, uh, I would say around the 1990s, hand in hand with a new rise of Islamism in the Middle East and a new uh, pressure on Christian populations of various denominations in the Middle East, arose the need and also increased secularization everywhere, including the Middle East, arose a need to discuss uh, these communities, uh, not along the lines of language and not along the lines of religion. So this has not been completely resolved. It is not clear how exactly we're going to do this. But uh, for medievalists, it is really a call to re-examine our premises and try to write the history of communities instead of the history of churches as institutions that keep communities together, and instead of the history of uh, uh, literatures expressed in a particular language, because as Alda's book shows, and as a number of examples in my own medieval universe show, uh, authors are, can be bilingual or trilingual, they write in all languages, but consistently in the Middle Ages and now, they do not write about the same things in each language, although they're the same people, and even when they treat some of the same topics, they do not talk about them in the same way. So this is an extremely important thing to pay attention to. And I think Alda's book uh, sheds light on, on, uh, on these problems. And it's a very important thing for a medievalist to pay attention to because we medievalists do not have as much information as modernists have. And the only way to better imagine, to kind of nuance our understanding of a medieval past is by looking at modern examples that are better recorded, that can be seen in greater detail, and then see whether they work based on the evidence we have in our hands or not. The other thing that uh, for me as a medievalist Alda's book speaks to is the construction of a modern uh, uh, national Iraqi identity, and especially uh, how um, uh, uh, Iraqi scholars write about the medieval past and the present implicitly by addressing the medieval past. The example I would uh, briefly like to address is um, a very well known, I think the star of uh, uh, Iraqi medievalists, uh, uh, Abdulaziz Adouri, 
uh, who wrote um, um, uh, his lifetime spans between 1919 and 2010. Uh, he was educated in Baghdad and at the University of London, and he spent his career in Iraq and in Jordan. An important part of his work focuses on the political, the social, and the economic history of the Abbasid period. And uh, when we compare him with other um, uh, medievalists writing in Arabic during the 20th century, uh, he subsumed Islam to Arabism. And uh, his work also has a pioneering feature. Uh, what he emphasizes is the unity of language. So what he sees as a constituent part of modern Iraqi identity is the use of the Arabic language. So in that sense, uh, the Assyrians fit as long as they use Arabic, but do not fit uh, as long as they use Assyrian. And uh, he also emphasizes economic and social developments as decisive factors that contributed to the emergence of Arab nationhood. Uh, the reason I choose him is because um, uh, although he wrote most of his work in Arabic, there's at least one very famous book that he originally wrote in English as a series of lectures in Georgetown. And there, there is a summary of, uh, of these ideas. And um, it is very interesting that he has a chapter where he treats uh, uh, individual groups that make up modern Iraq, going all the way back to their ancient and medieval roots. And nowhere does he speak of their religion. And uh, this is extremely interesting because for Duri, Duri is like uh, the Iraqi elite, the Ba'ath elite uh, is a Sunni Arab. Uh, but as Iraqis and scholars of Iraq well know, uh, Sunni Arabs in Iraq are not the demographic majority. So the problem for Duri is how to make things fit when uh, you have a, a, I'll call it a patchwork of, of different groups, ethno-religious groups uh, that are a majority if taken together, but are ruled by a minority. So I think in that sense, Alda's book, um, uh, these are developments that happen exactly during the period that Alda's book addresses. And in that sense, the Assyrian paradigm is not a paradigm that is kind of internalist, that talks to itself but is an exportable paradigm that can talk to uh, uh, Iraqi ethnogenesis at large. And as scholars of Iraq know, and as Iraqis themselves know, this is a very complicated business that took, part the, that took place for the last hundred years, effectively. So uh, this is, uh, in my view, uh, not simply a book that is in of interest to the modern Assyrian community and especially Iraqi Assyrians, but can speak to many different disciplines and say a lot of different things. I could keep going, but I stop here and I, I wanna generously leave um, 40, uh, 35 minutes uh, for discussion. And uh, I would like to invite everybody on the floor uh, to chime in, say anything you want to say. And I'm, I'm, uh, please uh, submit these questions to the chat. I'm going to read them aloud. I do not see anything. So I will address the question to Alda. <laughs> I have one too when you're Oh, done. please go ahead, go ahead. I, I was just curious if you could tell us a little about the process of researching and writing this, because I think it involved some pretty um, challenging research trips, ethnography, um, probably in the diaspora and in Iraq. And so I just wondered if you could um, give us a sense of what you, what, what lengths you went to to write this story. Thank you, uh, Christine um, and Marie also for your uh, commentary. So um, the my first research trip. So I, I was born in Iraq. I left as a as a child uh, in the nineties uh, following the war and the sanctions. So the, my first research back to, research trip back to Iraq was uh, as an MA student uh, in two thousand seven two thousand and eight, um, and. 
at that time, I was interested in, in, in these um, newly developing grassroots organizations um, and, and very quickly learned after the fall of the Ba'ath regime, 2003, uh, very quickly learned that actually the 60s and 70s were quite important. Uh, some groups were not new groups. They had been, their foundation was in the 60s and 70s. Uh, and, and this this is how I my, my interest in this period um, uh, first generated, basically. So. Um, the good thing about my master's project was I did a lot of field work, a lot of interviews uh, with these civil society or grassroots organizations that were around at the time, 2007, 2008, um, women's groups, student groups, youth groups, um, religious uh, groups, um, humanitarian, political, intellectual. So that was very important for me. Um, in a new Iraq, a new uh, an Iraq that I had left for for twenty plus years, to return to as an academic, as a professional, um, and when I started the PhD project, especially since I really wanted to give this kind of history and look at all these different the involvement of Assyrians, as you as you um, suggest, you know, that there's a lot of negotiations. Um, the political parties at the period that I'm studying post genocide are no longer so they do not have political representation autonomous political representation uh, after the genocide period, particularly after the cement massacre of 1933. Um, or, or they're not significant so so they're being attracted to um, these groups um, that given their urbanization, given their unionization and, and, and their position, they're attracted to these other Iraqi political groups. And that's one way that, yes, they do not have a, a larger political um, uh, or protective power that's that's guiding them, helping them, uh, but that they try to integrate themselves in different, in different um, groups. So to, to do this, especially to, to look at the movements in the North, I needed oral histories, I needed access to private collections. Um, and that civil society work, that, that work from, from my master's degree, those networks, those connections I had made mm -hmm. helped me. When I went back in, in, uh, later on mm -hmm. um, to do research uh, at the Iraqi National Library and Archives, uh, and then um, go to the North. It, at that time, I mean, you had to be careful. Um, you, I spent a lot of time uh, there in, in private uh, and, and uh, libraries closed early. I learned that once I got there. Uh, so, you know, I tried to arrange my time. And then um, in the north, um, I ha always had a really wonderful driver that uh, um, <laughs> helped, helped me because, you know, sometimes you're driving for hours and it's just you and him and uh, lots of security checks. Um, it was it was challenging. It was also very rewarding. Um, and um, and it was difficult. I mean, ISIS happened in 2014, just before I defended my my dissertation. And it was, it was you know, to, to think of all these villages and towns and people who had welcomed me in their home, I slept in their houses and who are, you know, displaced now. And it was very challenging. But um, um, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy with the outcome. And I'm, and I'm glad it's behind me. I think my next project, I'll be a little bit less, um, uh, you know, try to do something maybe a bit smaller. <laughs> less ambitious. Right? Yeah, less ambitious. Yeah. Alda, we have a question from Michelle Shamawel from Sydney, Australia. Uh, what theoretical framework did you draw upon in your study? That, that's a good question. I think um, mostly my, um, the, for me, it was how to look at minor, how, how to, I mean, of course, the term minorities or minoritized communities, I'm, I'm using it uh, given the literature that, that I situate my own work within. Uh, the Assyrians themselves do think of themselves as a nation. They, they during the World War I period at the time, they were requesting an, a national homeland for themselves as well. Um, they are call different things by, by different governments. The Baathist, early Baathists uh, do call them uh, in, in the preface of Law 2, uh, 251, which is the, the cultural and linguistic rights that are offered to them, um, a national minority, though by the end of the 70s, early 80s are called a denomination. Why? Because, uh, and, and the Iraqi census technically only allows them to choose between um, Kurdish and, and Arab as an identity. So, so there's shifting ways of looking at them. And, and in terms of 
internally the community, um, you know, the, the, the ancient uh, Mesopotamian Assyrian heritage is, is, is an important part of their uh, way of identifying the, the Syriac Christian heritage along with the language uh, and, and their cultural tradition. So, so there's different aspects and they do negotiate sometimes, you know, if you're living in rural versus urban centers, when there's more censorship when, or, or there isn't certain, you know, the Iraqi Ba'athist government, for instance, accepts the, the ancient Christian power, the, the, the Christian uh, heritage, uh, the, ling the linguistic, um, Aramaic, uh, or, you know, they, they use the term uh, Syrian or, or Syriac, um, uh, the cultural traditions, these are accepted, but the ancient path is not. So, so the intellectuals do negotiate, and then the oppositional groups that which formed by the late 1970s, you have an autonomous um, political uh, parties that, that are forming in the 1970s in their slogans, you know, for instance, the Syrian Democratic Movement in, of 1972. Um, the Assyrian uh, national identity are, are and, and uh, a free democratic Iraq are the slogans that they, you know, so, so they, they, they understand that having a democratic state and, and the recognition of them as a, as a national identity are, are important. Um, so, so going back to the question, um, minoritization and pluralism are an important um, framework for me to, I think, especially when it comes to, um, Middle Eastern Christians, we either think of them as um, European stooges, uh, fifth columns in their societies, or their persecuted communities. When it comes to the Assyrians, we only think of them as those who collaborated with the British uh, World War One, and, and and maybe there's mention of the Semen massacre. So we only and why? Because that is. Um, based on the sources that we have access to. So as Middle East historians, it's usually British archives because it's easy and it's wonderful to do research in England. I, I loved it. It was <laughs> wonderful. Um, and, and also that's, you know, in terms of languages, you might not know Aramaic, uh, you might only know Arabic. So, so that, that's a, that it's, it solves your problem. Um, and um, so what I wanted to do, what I, I did not want to ignore their minoritization. So here I'm, I'm referring to their marginalization. I think it was important to document that they are marginalized, they are persecuted. But at the same time, the pluralistic engagements and, and the maybe short-lived agency, um, uh, you know, the, the shifting agencies, I, I, I like the term that you're using, Christine, uh, that I think is also important to document because they do have agencies uh, and they find agency in, in particular spaces. It could be the space of the opposition. It could be in particular rural uh, communities. It could be among these, you know, hybrid intellectuals. There is this hybridized, you know, hierarchical space that exists in Baghdad, for instance. They are writing in Arabic and in Aramaic. And as Maria, uh, uh, you know, um, in her, comments. Uh, thank you, Maria. Uh, yes, they're writing different. You know, the, the, the audiences are different. They're not translations. So, so I sometimes I am asked, are these translations? They're not. Um, the Arabic and the Aramaic is, is very different. Sometimes the same author, the February fire traditions, for instance, appears in three different languages. Uh, at the very end, during the, the, the war, um, Murdan al Turaya adopts English only. And the English is really only for Western audiences because they want to, you know, it's, it's the, uh, it's a War and, and the Ba'ath regime wants to feature itself to Western audiences in a, in a particular light. So even the February fire tradition that I read to you in the, at the beginning was different from how it was published a few years earlier. So, um, you know, it's not just that they're not only aware of the different audiences, um, but they're also, so they're having an internal dialogue, they're having an external dialogue, but at the same time, it, it's a gen different generation. Sometimes the, those who are fluent in Aramaic, both in written and, and, and um, uh, spoken in uh, senses, um, are older, right? Those who are fluent in Arabic might be younger. They, they these are um, Iraqis um, or Assyrians born in generally the 1950s, let's say, who 1950s, late 40s, who are urbanized and, and they do eventually feel part of the Iraqi state. They're going to state education, they're receiving state education, they're going to universities. Um, and, and there's the sense of positivism in the 1970s due to oil money that's increasing, mm -hmm. you know, Iraqis. Uh, so economy and politics has a lot to do with it. So there is a sense of belonging. Uh, that's why even their political parties that they eventually form after 
decades of, of you know, not being able to after the, um, you know, uh, they, they, they include a free democratic Iraq. For them, they do see themselves as part of an Iraqi um, a sphere uh, that they, they can receive their rights if Iraq is democratic. Um, there are, I mean, you could argue that there's many different conversations. The Assyrians are part of a larger transnational community. Uh, Iranian Assyrians are quite significant because Iran is supporting the opposition and then during the Iran-Iraq war again, um, it becomes some, some sort of a safe haven along with Syria for them. So there's really many different dynamics that are always shifting. I, I really wish I had used that word in the book, Christine. Um, so, so they're shifting, they're changing uh, and, and there are negotiations happening. The Iraqi state just before the Algiers agreement uh, was signed, which ended the, um, the support of Iran uh, to the opposition temporarily. Again, they started after a few years when the Shah was displaced. Um, they, they, um, they are in negotiations when they bring back the Patriarch of the Church of the East, along with certain leaders. They're having these private conversations and saying to them, we will help you create um, a militia you have to this militia that will be against the the Iraqi opposition in the north, which includes uh, communists and 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 Kurds, um, particularly the the Kurdistan Democratic Party, um, and of course the Syrian tribal leaders. You know you have Khed Khed Allah, the first uh, created at this time or second rather. Um, if we will help you create a militia and we will give you an autonomous region like the Kurds, you know, so the Kurds have an administrative political, the, the Kurds at this point are, the, the Ba'athist negotiations with them are, are a bit different, right? The Syrians are given cultural rights, the Kurds are also given political rights and have an, an autonomous uh, region. Uh, the Assyrians are being promised under the table, if you turn against the opposition, we will also help you do this. What happens? The Algiers agreement happens. So timing becomes uh, always uh, an issue at, at, at certain times. So um, I, I, I hope I answered your question. Um... We have more questions on the chat. Okay. And from Ninos de Marchi, how much did the destruction of the Iraqi archives affect your research? And how did you supplement that material to tell a more complete story of the modern Assyrians? And what material, if you wish you could have access to, would you, like, would you have liked to include in your book? Thank you, Ninos. Uh, uh, this is a, an excellent question. So I was surprised by the Iraqi archives. I was the first, as far as I know, I was the first um, American scholar uh, or scholar from North America to go and do research at the Iraqi archives, National Archives. Uh, there was at the same time a, another person who came, another Iraqi, um, a French um, uh, scholar who came um, to do research there. But I was the first, so I did not know what to expect. Um, everything I found, I was delighted. It was it was wonderful, you know. So, so they told me you will not find anything from the sixties, seventies, and and I knew that the 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 Ba'athis archives. Um, were at the Hoover Institution, um, but I wanted something more than that. So um, the what I found there was the police records, which were very important. Um, the they were challenging to deal with. They were um, macrofiches from the 1960s, so very difficult to go through. But sometimes they had files, so basically they had what what, what they called a daftar or a notebook with handwritten notes of people who they tried accused of being communists, whether they were communists or they were not, you know, I, I explore that in the book, it's a, it's a different issue, but these were names. So sometimes one name is given, but then actually this, this group, which they call a cell is like 14 people. Um, and, and sometimes, so you go through this file and what I did was, so um, this was something, uh, you know, you learn to do when you're working on minority communities uh, or, you know, uh, minoritized communities yeah, as the Assyrians because um, they, they don't have their own archives. So I just went through the names, any name that seemed Assyrian or neutral or Christian, I pulled. Sometimes these files did not exist. They, they had been destroyed. Sometimes they did. Sometimes they had files on a whole village or town, which was amazing. But that file, in reality, they could not find it for me at the back. So I, I found a lot of those and, and those became the, the basis for my um, that first chapter. Other material, what I had to do was uh, supplement it. You, you know, things like the Mordana Turaya or other magazines. I called um, some librarians that we have in the West. Um, they had one issue or two of it. 
I knew if I was going to do a whole chapter on the press, I needed many, many issues. I needed many, many years. So I can see how the dialogue is changing. What are the trends? How is it affected? How does policy affect what these intellectuals are writing about? And I, I wanted um, at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, which from what I'm told, uh, these archives are now returned to Iraq. I, I, we don't know where they are exactly. Uh, it's, it's, it's important and I'm happy that they are returned uh, because really people in Iraq did not have any access to archival material and they cannot do research on their country, which is very unethical. Um, but you know, I, I use that material, but also material archives. Uh, certain political parties in Iraq, I found again through my interactions that were involved in 2003 with the US um, um, invasion or, you know, um, they had archives of their own communities. How that came to be, I don't know, right? But certain, these political parties that were involved, all of them have collections of their community. So I use those as well. But uh, basically, so the, 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 arc, the, um, the paragraph at the beginning that I read to you that the um, February fire, that chapter looks at only Assyrian intellectual production, basically, music and mostly press. But the chapter before it looks at the Baathist archive. So these two chapters are sort of mirror images of each other. I wanted to give the Assyrians a voice, but also look at what the state was writing. What were they thinking about the Assyrians? And it's interesting. They do write about the press. They do monitor not only what Assyrians are writing and singing about, but also what Assyrian Iranians are writing, what Assyrians in Sweden are proposing. I mean, it, it's really wonderful. I mean, not wonderful, but it, it just, just how they're, you know, their web is everywhere and they're monitoring. You know, there's a radio um, signal that's picked up from Iran that Assyrians in, in Iraq can hear and, and they're concerned about that. Mm -hmm. So, and, and they're translating these, these uh, works and, and it's appearing, the translations are appearing in the, in, in the archives. Um, the rural movements was the most difficult. The, 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 the chapter that I write on the rural movements, because you just do not have much material. You know, you look at the press, these people are called, if, if they're mentioned, they're criminals, they're, they're presented from a particular perspective. For that chapter, I did a lot of oral interviews and I tried to include as much as I can. Women were also difficult. I really wanted, it was important for me, as you can see on the cover, you know, we have these two uh, wonderful women. Um, the cover was, was uh, you know, difficult to find the, 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 the image. I mean, archiving is important and unfortunately, a certain archives, um, we're working on them, of course, but um, there's a lot that's lacking. Um, you know, so so oral histories and music for me was important because for a community like the Assyrians, not all of them were were fluent in the Aramaic language. They could not read and write, read and write, but they spoke it. It was their mother tongue. It was important to them. So music is is really important, um, and um, I, I rely on on. Um, uh, uh, Amir, um, the late Amir um, Hassanpour, uh, who, who taught at the University of Toronto, uh, he had an, a wonderful article about uh, listening versus reading public. Um, and and um, for the Assyrians, that's important because uh, they they are a listening public. So so music, you know, versus reading, they cannot, not all of them have been given the ability to read or stand you know, in their language because uh, at particular times, um, the private schools were closed down by the state and they eventually became uh, public schools. So, um, so music is also an important medium and, and through the modern technology of a cassette tape, they really seep through the borders. It's wonderful. I mean, um, the, the execution of, of uh, Assyrians and political parties in 1983, um, singers in Chicago are singing about this and 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 they're black label I mean they cannot technically officially they cannot enter the Iraqi market but they do through the the porous borders especially where the opposition is and these spaces and and Iraqi Assyrians are listening to these things what what these singers are creating in in uh, Chicago and in California as well they come to them and and they 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 just very easily if you have a double decker you 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 make these cassette tapes you pass them from household to household and and you listen and it's important because it it helps you, um, it reinforces your own narrative of who you are and, and, um, and what, what you stand for as a community. I want to use the opportunity of your mention of the fragility and the disappearance of Assyrian archives to uh, announce to a broader group, we have a worldwide um, audience of Assyrians, I believe, uh, here today. So I want to announce that the University of California at Berkeley 
thanks to a seed gift by Francis Sargis and with the help of our rare book and manuscript library, the Bancroft Library, has launched with Alda's instrumental help an effort to archive the modern Assyrian experience. And uh, we, have, uh, we are about to receive in less than a week from now, two very important donations. One is uh, textbooks for school instruction in Iraq written in Assyrian during the 1990s. We are about to receive a full set of those uh, from the Assyrian Aid Fund. And um, we are extremely happy about it because we believe it will give future um, uh, researchers the ability to not only understand the conditions of education for Assyrians in Iraq around that time, but uh, also the difficulty of translating into like modern concepts in a language that was not doing this habitually up until that point. We are extremely grateful to the Assyrian Aid Society for doing this for us. And uh, we are also about to receive the archive of the extremely important Assyrian poet, Sargon Boulos. And um, uh, we um, would welcome discussions with you if you think of anything, if you have anything, the particular um, um, angle that we have because of the type of things that the Bancroft collects is uh, that this has become part of the Bancroft collection on Western Americana. It's a leading collection in the world for this. So it's easier for us to accept this material if it informs in any way the experience of Assyrians in California. It's particularly important for us that Sargon Boulos was the translator into Arabic of the beat poets of uh, uh, San Francisco. So this was the angle that we have to accept him. Uh, but you know, if we can imagine an angle, if you want to give us materials, we'll work with you please contact me via email. You can find me on the website of the history department at Berkeley. Please contact ALDA. Uh, we have uh, this uh, tremendous, uh, we are at the beginnings of a long-term effort. And uh, there are other things in the works that I'm not gonna talk about because it's not money in the bank, but uh, we are taking ourselves seriously in, in this effort and uh, we'd appreciate your help. And um, I see um, uh, another question, and I think Alda may have an answer. Are there any plans or intentions to have the book translated into Arabic and Kurdish to make it available to a broader audience within Iraq? This work would certainly help promote a culture of greater understanding and tolerance in Iraqi society, especially as Assyrians are increasingly marginalized. Alda, do you want to say anything? Thank you. I mean, it, there, there's n nothing official yet. There's been interest in Arabic translations. I haven't been uh, approached about Kurdish, but but the book has just come out, and hopefully there will be interest. And I agree with you. I think it's, um, you know, I, I would uh, love to see it in, in different languages uh, that other Iraqis in um, in Iraq can also use and, and understand. English is not going to be as accessible to to everybody. So I'm, I'm aware of that, and I thank you for uh, the suggestion. I want to address uh, Tony Hoshaba's remark. Do you accept magazines, books, videos in this UC Berkeley archive? If yes, what is the address to send the materials? Uh, please uh, get in touch with me. I have to clear it. My name, as I said, is Maria Mavrudi. You can find me on the website of the history department. I have to clear it with the curators of the Bancroft. It's not my decision or Alda's decision alone, but we'd be thrilled to discuss this with you. I also have a recurring question from uh, Michelle Shamawel on um, uh, theories used in analyzing your raw data. And uh, I, I wanna give my, my two cents, also picking up on something that Christine mentioned in her response, namely uh, the um, uh, concepts about nations and national communities that have been around during the period that Alda's book covers. And uh, so th there is, um, on the one hand, you have the inheritance from romantic nationalism on the antiquity and permanence of nations, uh, which early on, I'd say in the 1950s, but really with uh, force, uh, already things came out in the 1960s, uh, but really with force in the 1980s, 
uh, talked about, um, uh, you know, offered a, a, a contradiction uh, to romantic nationalism. So uh, there, there were books like uh, Ernest Gellner's Thought and Change that came out in 1965. Uh, it was later expanded in another book by Gellner, Nations and Nationhood. Uh, Christine mentioned Benedict Anderson's Imagined Communities that came out in 1983. And uh, then there was, of course, Eric Hobsbawm's Nations and Nationalism since uh, 1780 which came out in 1992. And uh, basically they um, uh, talked about uh, nations as a modern invention that did not exist before. My own observation is that these three uh, extremely influential thinkers had themselves very complicated childhoods. None of them grew up in a single place. None of them was educated in a single educational system. And I think in many ways they projected their own experience in how they, they, they kind of constructed their own individual uh, and collective uh, sense of identity. There was pushback to this theory, uh, to this idea of nations as a construct, as a modern construct. And that was spearheaded by Anthony D. Smith, who happens to have been a student of Gellner's. And uh, in his own work, uh, he agreed that nationalism is indeed the product of modernity, but uh, he also insisted that nations did have pre-modern roots. And uh, I think this perspective was helped by his own earlier training in classics. And uh, he used classics like the ancient Greek, the Roman past in his own uh, work as a sociologist. More recently, there is a third approach that's gaining ground uh, by the sociologist Rogers Brubaker, who is a professor at the University of California at Los Angeles. So he offered that instead of viewing race, ethnicity, and nationhood in his expression as things in the world, he proposed that it is more productive to understand them as perspectives on the world rooted in individual and collective perceptions of reality. And since they are perspectives, they can shift depending on the conditions and depending on the audience that a speaker addresses or an individual thinks of themselves as part of. So I, um, I try to present very quickly for the non-specialist uh, the, the different options for uh, imagining or understanding uh, ethno-religious identities. And um, I, I wanted to invite Alda to offer her own two cents, like in these broad theories, do you position yourself and in which way based on the Assyrian paradigm? And maybe this clarifies a little bit Michelle's, Shamal's uh, uh, question. Yeah. I'm not quite sure what Michelle is asking. Right, Michelle, I, I, I think uh, I will yeah. send you my introduction. We can talk more about what you're what you're referring to. I mean, you're mentioning a few more things. I think that would be more helpful. But yes, I agree with you, Maria. Um, I am. I mean, I use imagined communities, Smith and others. But I think the Assyrians, as Maria suggested, and um, they do not fit these models uh, precisely. So um, that's that's all I can say at this point, I think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, different lenses, I'm not, Dina Buchstein. Uh, hmm, I, I, I can't make sense of that question. Let me see if there are any earlier questions. I do not see anything in my brief. There's a lot of chat. Um, I have a question of my own. Uh, you mentioned very quickly that the ancient Mesopotamian past is problematic in modern Iraq. And uh, of course, this is, um, you know, the, uh, it's, it's very important for a modern national narrative to have roots as far back as possible. And there are different experiences in different parts of the Middle East, depending, and it is inflected 
the, the so, so for example, uh, how is the pre-Islamic past viewed in, let's say in Saudi Arabia? How is the pre-Islamic past viewed in Northwest Africa? What is the role of the Berbers there? What is the role of the Phoenicians in modern day Lebanon? Who takes over the Phoenicians? I mean, there are certain parallels in these cases. It is the Christians of Lebanon that are interested in the uh, ancient Phoenicians more than the Muslims of Lebanon. So I was wondering if you have a comment on this one. Yeah, so the Mesopotamian past is problematic when it's used or applied to the Assyrians. So the, the, Assyri the, the state itself is um, engaged in this very large cultural heritage program and is investing a lot of money that they're making at this time. Like I said, in 1970s, you have oil production and they're trying to compete with Egypt. Egypt has an ancient past, right? So the Iraqis are also trying to create a narrative that um, Arab Arabizes Mesopotamianism. So, so they, they come up with theories that uh, the Assyrians or the Mesopotamians came from Arabia. So they're Arabizing um, Mesopotamianism. The Abbasid past is very important to them as well. Um, and, and all under the, you know, uh, along with Arab nationalism and pan-Arab nationalism to an extent. So, so they, they're, they are creating this um, well-constructed narrative supported by publications, magazines, by an increase in tourism, by an attraction of Western scholars and such, uh, uh, conferences. Um, there, there's a lot invested by the state. Others have written on this. Um, but when it comes to the Assyrian community, which to me is still puzzling, why did they not just incl include them in this narrative that they've constructed? Um, they they um, refer to the ancient Assyrians as Ashuriyin, Right, the 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 modern Assyrians, um, not early on, but mid seventies and onwards, especially, uh, they're very careful in what term the Assyrians use in in urban centers and in these magazines. So the Assyrians can be referred to as Athurin, right? The the shift is change used, and it's 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 very important because if you if you're an Ashuri, you are an, you're tracing your history back to the ancient. So, so they're censored this. Um, uh, cultural clubs that have the name Ashuriyin use uh, are, are, um, are, you know, uh, they're called into questioning. They're, um, uh, they're bothered. They're told that uh, you have chauvinistic practices. We're not allowing you to do uh, A, B, and C and such. Um, so, so that's how they use it. Why? I mean, one, one way of thinking about it, and, and I make this argument in the book, is that, um, Perhaps the, the the claim, the native claim of the Assyrians, and and their rejection of Arab nationalism clashes or does not fit well in the in the uh, narrative that the state is creating. So you know um, the Assyrians are thought of as foreigners; they're not native components mm -hmm. of the country. So if they're not native, they cannot be Assyrian. Yes. Uh, and if, and if they're Assyrian and they are not Arab, well, that does not fit the narrative that's being mm -hmm. created by the nation state, mm -hmm. by the by the Arab, by the Ba'athist state. So so they're they're uh, the Assyrians cannot be also Mesopotamian. They cannot be Assyr ancient Assyrians. Uh, they can be Christian. This is the, the Syriac heritage is supported, uh, Syriac Christian heritage, that is, mm -hmm. uh, language. Uh, in fact, the, the law, um, Law 252, that I referred to, calls the communities the Syriac speakers um, or the speakers of the Syriac language. And not the same, the Syriani. That's, that's mm -hmm. the term, you know, how the community is referred to. Uh, mm -hmm. So, so. I hope I'm answering your question, but um, there's a, a really a great article by Marian Guerges, who's a political scientist, mm -hmm. um, which addresses the term minoritization, and and she she takes issue not not minority minority takes issues with that, mm -hmm. and and uh, uses indigenous mm -hmm. um, methodology and practices in her work. It mm -hmm. just came out, and I think it complicates our our understanding of Assyrians and their connection to the land and uh, and their the problems of the state at at, at various points. Yes, we have two minutes and I do not know uh, if um, this is answerable, but uh, I was chastised by Sam Haddad that I missed his question and I'm grateful he sent it again. And uh, I think this is a question for a political analyst. I don't know if it's for a scholar, mm -hmm. but he asks, Alda, in your opinion, do you think that Assyrians may be able diplomatically to gain some local autonomy? We have two minutes. I don't know if you want to. What do you want to do with this question? 
as a historian, I can tell you that it has been tried many times. I refer to World War One period. Um, the Ninva Plain, uh, just recently, uh, 2014, again, they were pushed to the creation of a um, safe haven uh, and then an administrative uh, region or local administration. And then a province in 2014, uh, President Anuri Maliki approved uh, that one of the, the official languages of the state are not only Arabic and Kurdish, but also Syriac and, and Turkma Turkish, Turkmani. Uh, and also that three new provinces would be created and the Nineveh Plain would be one of these provinces. But of course, we know what happened after January of 2014 in July or August of 2014, ISIS invaded. So that idea was put to, um, to bed. Uh, honestly, I, I maybe others can answer this question better who have um, a better political analysis uh, or understanding of, of uh, contemporary affairs. Mm -hmm. I think we are right on cue for our scheduled, our appointed time. I want to thank Alda for very generously uh, explaining many different aspects of her work to all of us. I also want to thank our lively and engaged audience. I am so glad that um, I, I had already an expression of interest in uh, the Assyrian archive we are launching here at the Bancroft. And uh, I hope to see some of you in our future events covering the Assyrian experience here at UC Berkeley. I uh, say uh, good morning, good night, wherever you are around the world. This is the beauty of the World Wide Web. We cannot have the immediacy of each other's presence, but we have a tremendous geographic expanse. And uh, again, I want to thank Alda and all of you for being present. And uh, I hope we'll see you soon. Thank you so much, Maria and, Chris, um, and Christine for, for your commentary and um, uh, everyone else for joining us and, and for these uh, wonderful questions that you asked. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay.